I have a lot of old hard drives and a lot of other old computer parts. I mainly do laptop repair, so I actually don't get to use these desktops that often. So I decided to come up with a project to use some of the more useful parts and make a network attached storage unit for zero dollars. And well, it just turned out to be having eight terabytes of capacity. Probably not after some of the drives are rated together, but this is the video on the hardware build. Okay, so let's go into the parts I chose. So one of the first things I got was I wanted a motherboard with a little bit of capacity, so Core 2 Duo. And I took this case because it was micro ATX and was beat up enough that I wouldn't feel modifying it with this uh, large five capacity caddy. So this is the final product. As you can tell, it's made for zero dollars. Um, I do uh, think it looks relatively okay for something you're not going to be looking at very often. But yeah. Let's see how we got from the beginning to the end of this build. And technically it's not the end because I haven't done the software part, but let's start with cleanup. So the first thing I did was, well, try to clean up some of those rust spots and gunk with contact cleaner. But to no avail, it wasn't really coming off at all. And after a little bit of doing that, I decided to move on to the more heavier options, which, since I had to drill it anyways, was sandpaper. Because when you drill metal, it tends to leave these little uh, kind of rough edges, so I just ended up sandpapering it. It looked a little bit shiny, and uh, I didn't really like the kind of brushed look there on that, so I decided to paint the thing. Probably a little bit overkill, but, um, yeah. The rest of the stuff, though, you could just use normal cleaning supplies to remove the gunk on the exterior. Not quite sure what it was from, but uh, I just used my normal method of wipes. And I did try using this uh, brush sort of thing earlier, where I typically use on ThinkPads, but I'll actually leave a little bit of, uh, well, paint streaks, which you know, if you do actually go over it again, they'll pretty much go away if the paint's good, but I wouldn't suggest using a magic eraser on a desktop board. But, you know, if you do have like some of those like disinfectant wipes. Oh, fuck. The next thing I had to do was fix the front panel because the front panel, like, essentially, it didn't work. This isn't it designed as a AT case, but the normal switch on it was getting a little bit finicky. So you'd kind of have to press it a bunch for it to turn it on. So I managed to find a switch that kind of fit. And the LEDs also didn't light up, but uh, it's a little, I mean, they were pretty dim, but the switch was the main concern. You at least need a power switch. So, I put in another power switch. Uh, it turned out the soldering was unnecessary. I managed to find one that like actually fit later, kind of. I mean, fit with some metaling with uh, Gorilla Glue. But either way, uh, it still works like how it was uh, meant to work originally. And I think it looks rather nice. Lo and behold, it was still a little bit finicky but uh, a lot better than it was prior, and the LED works. So, the next thing to do was, well, let's actually test some of those hard drives in there. So, I put in the four actual non-external um, drives into the Caddy, and pretty much went into the BIOS after just to see if they were there. So, all four red. Okay, now that you've tested everything, you might want to make sure that none of the wires on your computer are actually going to, you know, get in the CPU fan and things like that. And you might want to make sure it has some proper cooling of some sort, or 
I would at least, uh, I put in one of my better uh, spare power supplies. It might have actually been the best spare power supply I have, but that's because I don't like fire hazards. So let's go take a look at the build. So the first thing you can tell is, well, I put an 80 millimeter fan that's quite significantly quieter. Or actually, I'm not quite sure what millimeter is. Either way, it fit perfectly where the PCI slots would have gone. But it doesn't matter. There's no other peripherals in this. It's just going to hook up via Ethernet. And it's starting to look a little bit like a computer now. So next thing was install the hard drives. There's four of them. And there's three bolts on the bottom, which align with three bolt holes on the case. So the ones on the case... I actually did put some masking tape where the bolt holes would have been just because I was a little bit concerned about grounding and since all four SATA slots are being occupied I can't put in any sort of CDs or DVDs. You might wonder about IDE, this motherboard doesn't have them for some reason. So anyways, I just put in a little USB sort of thing there so I could put my external hard drive where the DVD bay used to go and then zip tied it. So let's take a look at this now that most of the wiring is actually done. As you can see the one thing is the motherboard's power supply wire going over the fan, but I fixed that on the final install. So one other thing, rubber stoppers. Okay, so hopefully the drill light didn't disturb you there, but uh, I, don't, I don't think I have a flashlight. Anyways, uh... Okay, so for the operating system, I went with Debian. I could have gone with OpenBSD or something similar. Uh, I'm just not quite sure about OpenBSD support for EXT4, and I'm probably going to have most of my drives at EXT4 at the moment. And I am going to set up RAID on a few of the drives, probably two of them, and then have like some cron jobs going for setting up specific folders to be copied over with rsync. So anyways though, that's not in this video, but we're gonna go over a basic Debian install for like something like a server really quick. So first thing, sorry about going a little bit quick there, but I just press enter twice for English and American English keyboard layout. I chose the non-graphical installer simply because, well, uh, I do mainly my installs just with a keyboard if it's a server or something like that. So let's get into this actually. Uh, it does take a little bit to start up, so I might as well just give some basic information about the different Debian installers. So, the major issue people have a lot of the time with installing Debian is the, well, Wi-Fi drivers. But this is a server, so it's not really much of a concern. I'm using net installation, and if you did have one that required different, uh, Wi-Fi drivers, they do have a non-free installer, but it still doesn't modify the sources list to add your specific Wi-Fi driver most of the time. But that's typically easily remedied by cha just changing the sources list. And I installed it on the one terabyte Toshiba uh, drive, partly because I think it's relatively reliable out of these. I just did all files in one partition. Um, but I don't think that's going to matter too much at the moment. So this is, you typically just go through the installer. I just selected guided. Most of the time when I do this, I actually use a script, but it allows you to select a few things to install. I decided I was just going to install a web server later on my own. It's not going to be public, so I'm not too concerned about security. Um, yeah, so... Uh, to make sure the system's uh, bootable, you're going to want Grub. I kind of just went with the normal, you know, Grub installation. And, yeah, that's pretty much how you install Debian in two minutes, I guess. 
Uh, if you want a more detailed version of that, I have a Debian i3 setup video. Uh, one other thing, I also wrote a script for installing my setup normally, but I didn't want to yank the hard drive out and put it back in. So to get Debian running, I just put a little USB stick in there. So let's go on to, well, let's see what we actually have in this thing. So I just took fdisk and I pretty much wrote it to a file. And now I'm just going to use VI to, well, look through said file. So, it is a 9.315 G, oh, gigabyte uh, drive at the beginning. It's uh, hard drive manufacturers use a different uh, size sort of figure than uh, most operating systems do. So... Yeah, 465, 500 gigabyte drive there. Uh, if you scroll down, um, give it a little bit. 1.8 terabyte drive for SDC. And, and what, what, what is that at now? Like, uh, we're at uh, 3.5 terabytes. So let's go down a little bit farther. We have another half terabyte drive. So that's SDD, now we're at four terabytes. And here's what's gonna make it an actual eight terabyte NAS. It's what's plugged in the external bay right now, which is a 3.7 terabyte drive, or a four terabyte drive, or whatever the manufacturer says it is, easy store. So essentially, we have a eight terabyte NAS, which, uh, I think it's pretty good for not spending any money, even though it's probably going to be a tab slow. And um, the reliability on this is definitely not industry grade. So, I guess after all of this, uh, we should probably finally see what it looks like. So, this is the front of it. You got the uh, extra airflow caddies and here's the side looks relatively normal except the electrical tape holding the broken faceplate on uh, I decided to make a little artwork on the cardboard with some sharpie and we have our acrylic I would have just used the full acrylic sheet but I didn't have enough acrylic and I kind of wanted that side to actually be closed because the airflow from the fan on the back going into the hard drives because I figure that's actually what's going to produce the most heat in this case. Um, with, uh, you know, it's okay I think. It's something I'm probably not going to look at that often. So I kind of went with a little bit of a uh, more meme-like sort of uh, appearance. But, zero dollars! And nothing spent, which is pretty good. So, peace, and uh, I guess uh, have a good one, YouTube.